So, why don't we start? What with it being time to start? <coughs> um, today, and probably next day too, there's no way we're getting done all these in one day. We're going to talk about exploring for data analysis, which is something you all know about. It may not be called that when you learn it, but it's something that it's basically like that, like that transition. <laughs> Pretty good, right? I'm not screwing around. Basically, we're going to talk about looking at batches of numbers and getting a feel for the numbers themselves. Right. So they say here, if you're going to find out anything about a data set, you first have to understand the data themselves. Know how I'm using data as a plural. So I said data themselves, because data is plural and datum is singular. I'm kind of old school about that. Also, I didn't joke. Those are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Anyway. What I'm talking about here is trying to get a feel for your numbers. So when you collect data, one of the really and you'll find this when you guys do your thesis. One of the things that really hits you right away is, oh, oh, I got that. I better analyze it right away and find out if I got a significant effect of whatever. It's very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's compelling to you to like, oh, I have to do this. I have to look at all this stuff right now. But really, what if you make mistakes in your numbers? Right, and you recorded those. Or you have software that did it and software makes mistakes. Software makes mistakes. Usually that's because humans made mistakes making the software, but nonetheless, you can actually get a pretty good feel of what actually happened. My PhD advisor, Sarah Shuttleworth, used to always say, statistics are there to, to prove what you already know. You've looked at the data, you've got some graphs, etc. You should be able to look at that and go, oh, I see what happened. And then say, okay, let's make sure this wasn't just ready to chance. Or it's easier to find odd values. Those odd values might be outliers, just something that doesn't belong. Or they might be, again, coding mistakes, things like that. Right, so let's say you're collecting data on. Cigarette smoking. Okay. Friend of mine did this years ago uh, and was trying to determine a way to guess how to, to actually, actually to accurately measure how many cigarettes someone smoked a day. By the way, self reports of cigarettes per day by smokers is off. They tend to underestimate how much they smoke. Right? Now, there are ways to do this, and there are, they're somewhat invasive. It involves spitting into a vial, and I can measure how much. Nicotine's in your saliva, and I can measure how much cotinine, which is a state of metabolite of nicotine. Uh, but I know the half life of it, it's easy to do. I can, I can send all that shit to a lab. How about instead of sending it to a lab, I can give you a questionnaire? Yep, great. And I, can, and I can then validate this questionnaire, and I can actually, I mean, just all be behavioral things. That'd be awesome. So my buddy Todd did this. I was able to actually do a pretty nice job of it. When you look at the data set, there's one person who reported smoking 400 cigarettes a day. I don't know about you, if you've ever smoked before, it's a lot of smoking. That's Screw the Olympics Go Pro. That's like 40 is two packs, basically. Let's say there's 20 in a pack, you have 25, whatever. Even the 25, so that's eight packs of cigarettes a day. Who oh boy. First of all, you'd be uh, broke. Not so much in 1988 when Todd collected these data with cigarettes for $2 a pack. Nonetheless. Also, wouldn't think you'd have the energy to even just fill out the form. What with the cardiovascular issues? It's probably a mistake in coding. Probably. It could be the person that filled out the questionnaire. This was done at the Ontario Science Center in Toronto. Uh, which is a great place to do sort of behavioral research because people are interested in science. So they'll come up to a table and say, cigarette smoking survey, and they'll fill it out. It's a great place to collect it. Um, science loves like that too. If, if you can get in there, it's better than like sitting in a mall going, who filled out my questionnaire? 
No one wants to do that. They're shopping. Or whatever is people do at the mall. I don't leave my house to shop anymore. I point, I click, so things arrive at people's houses already wrapped with clever little quips and cards from Uncle Dave. My nephews don't really like the gifts I get them, but they like the clever little jokes. And screw them if they don't like the gifts. But you look at this guy and say, like, either he's lied, which is possible, or he mis wrote that wrong, or he actually does smoke 400 cigarettes a day, and he's from a different population of people altogether. We can't use him to generalize to the average smoker. It's possible, more likely, it was a mistake, right? In code. But when you see that, you go, okay, we probably should throw out all his data, or at least that one that one. That's just an example. So, what I'm talking about here is called exploratory data analysis of EDA. Um, it's actually overlooked. Like I said, there's this, there's this rush to, like, I want to do inferential statistics, I must do a t test now. It was a guy who took this program, this psych program here, five or six years ago. He was so obsessed with T-Test, his name, his, his name, nickname in the apartment became T-Test. We started calling him T-Test. This is developed by John Tukey. Uh, John Tukey on the right, you may have heard of the Tukey test. It's a post-hoc test. Now it's a very, it's a very important statistician. A lot of inferential stuff he developed. But he also realized that you've got to look at the numbers themselves. Get a feel for them. Describe them. This allows you to generate, sorry, generate hypotheses as well as get a feel for your data. Because once you've collected data, you can say, oh, I wonder what would happen if I tried this. I know when someone does their honors thesis with me, when they have like, data meetings with me, once they're collecting data, I don't want to see means. Typically, I don't want to see t tests and f tests eventually. Oh, you see, tell me some pictures. Make some graphs. What kind of graphing software? A piece of graph paper and a pen will do just fine. I just want to see what it looks like. Just so I can look at your data and go, OK, I think this happened. We already know how we're probably going to analyze this, and you should know how you're not going to analyze your data before you collect them. But you want to be able to look at something and say, OK, yeah, this should work. This should work. Let's try that. Yeah, I feel sure I want to see means. I want to see standard deviations. But at first, I want to see pictures. Okay? And that's what this is. It's pictures. It's numbers that describe numbers. Really simple things. And stuff that we spend hardly any time on, say, in intro stats. And we probably ought to spend more, but we can't do this. Shoehorn, shoehorn, and all this other content. So you're going to get an idea if your experiment worked or not without losing any richness in your data. In other words, you're not going to lose any of the numbers. They're all still going to be there. Make sense? Any questions so far? I don't know what these numbers represent. I have no creative abilities whatsoever. OK, let's pretend. It's uh, a small statistics class, and the test is at a 35. We got an x value. That's how much the people got, how many points they got, at a 35. And the frequency is how many people got those points. So one person got 10 out of 35. A couple got 23 of that's not bad. Most people, five of them, got 25 out of 35. What, five sevenths? It's 71, that's pretty good. Two people got 30 out of 35, that's pretty good. 33 out of 35, and then we have somebody but perfect. Gee, so far that, that looks pretty good, right? I would be, if I was teaching this class, I would not be upset by a distribution like that. By a sort of study of distribution, let's not talk about distribution, but by a set of scores like that. I look at a set of scores like that, I wouldn't be. Well, hmm. I might be concerned about 10 out of 35. It's not very good. It's like 28%, something like that. Maybe person missed some classes. Right? 
Maybe they're not actually in the class, they just came and wrote a test because they're weird. You ever go to the wrong class if this ever happened to anybody? Like, especially in first year? Like, if you did it now, you just get up and leave, right? But in first year, you're already scared. You did it, so did I. In a big auditorium. Yeah. It was so embarrassing. I was, in, I was in a class with this size at Western, and I walked in, and I thought I was going into my history class, and it turned out it was like a fourth year chemical engineering class. Like, I saved the whole thing. I looked at so stupid. <laughs> 10 out of 35 is bad. That's almost to the point you say, everything you think is right, put the opposite down. It'll do way better. <laughs> Okay. So we've got one, frankly, pretty shitty grade here, but the rest of them are actually pretty okay. I would be very pleased with a, a bunch of grades like that. The nice thing is, if I put my head sideways, I can also see a distribution, right? So that's reasonable. So this sort of relative frequency table like that makes things pretty easy. I've still got all the numbers are still there. I can get them all back. And I get, oh man, so they should sign, run for your lives. I just sum the frequencies times the, the numbers. Which I this should be a obviously this should be a this zero should be an end parentheses. Made these slides up ten years ago. So every year I say, you know, I'm gonna change that. Never do. Uh shift. We're about to shift. So we could actually end up with a total. Our total score is 309. I don't know why that's useful, but it would allow us to probably calculate some stuff. Like, I oh, mean, you do that later. We could, instead of having that table, we could have a histogram. I'm taking antihistograms, they're really important. Uh, thank you. Joke there. Small bit. Really hard thing to joke at all. Obviously. Uh, so you can use the, the stuff from a, that table to make a relative frequency histogram. You want to say, Dave, how did you do that? And I will say this. I put it into, uh, this wasn't Excel, I did it with numbers in that program. And I just selected histogram, and it made one. I hadn't given it any parameters. I just used the defaults. I'm going to obsess over this writing lab slide for the rest of the I don't know why. Still here. I was like looking to see if there are English mistakes or things like that. There used to be a sign that just said writing help, and it was a question mark, and I wrote underneath it sentence fragment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they changed that poster. <laughs> The ready lab are great, don't understand me. I just, I'm a smart ass. Uh, okay, look at this. This is great because, I don't, like I said, you can eventually you can screw around with parameters in Excel or Google Docs. Uh, Google Docs do almost everything Excel does now. Numbers is the one for Mac, so I just have that because I, I live in the map of the universe. I'm not even caring what these are. But I can see 30, 33, 35, yeah, okay. There's no nine, but there's, there's that guy at 10. The, 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 in fact, the x, sorry, the y axis makes literally no sense because you can't, obviously you couldn't get halves and quarters of points. Sorry, you, there aren't halves and quarters of people. But I don't care. This is just for me to get a feel for my numbers. And as you can see, this all looks pretty good except for our, our poor friend here, right? We should perhaps consider a different major. I shouldn't say one task, you shouldn't consider a different major. One paper, I did that once, I have 60 in a, a normal psychology paper in third year. Well, that's it, I'm changing the history. And then I did some quick arithmetic and realized that it didn't really affect my overall average, and I stayed in psychology, and you're so much to be luckier for that. Or this would be a course on World War II airplanes. Which would also be fun. Um, perhaps much more fun than this. So, like I said, this isn't something you present in an article or a thesis or something. This is just for you. This is to look at it and go, okay, I see the shape. 
There's something weird going on at the far left. Everything else is fine. Make sense? I've lost no richness in my data. I can literally <coughs> reconstruct the data set from looking at this picture. <coughs> Had I told it not to use decimal points on the x or sorry, y axis, it would be even easier. But I can reconstruct the whole data set here. This is nice. Right? I can reconstruct the whole thing. So that's very useful. And these are the kind of things, like I said, when I when, when my thesis students, when they show me data, I often have them just bring in stuff. I say, just tell uh, Excel to print out two histograms, one for each group, or four, or one for each group, whatever. I just want to let's just look at them. Let's see their shape the same. Let's see that they all have a one peak. Right? Things like that. Just so we can look at it and go, okay, yeah, it's fine. And then we can look and go, oh, those are different than those two. Then we can go play with them. You know, when I say we, you can go play with them. It also allows you to slot armies on poor bugger here at 10 and 45. Make sense so far? Right? And it's stuff I'm sure you've run into before. And you get way caught up. You still get caught up in this in 2126? The real limits and the different things for categories on the on the y on the, on the x-axis. You get not because it doesn't matter. It's one of those things that doesn't really matter at all. You, you get caught up in those. Okay. So that, those are numbers. Uh, categorical data are different. Categorical data, you can look at a histogram, you get a bar graph. Um, you could also use a pie chart. People like pie charts. Some people, it tends to be people that are, I don't know, like business people like pie charts. There's something uh, that the uh, people that are purchasing have worked out. I, it doesn't help me, but if it helps you, use it. That's always been, this is all about you doing this for yourself. So if pie charts help you, you use a pie chart. So they're basically a, a, a regular, you know, sort of bar graph and a histogram are roughly the same thing, except the x-axis has to be a scale. So let's say in tw stack 2126, the last time I taught it, which was 2009, no, it was older than that. Let's look at stack 2126. It's a long time ago. And that was back when everybody took the same stats class. So sociology students took, our, took the stat course, and CESD took it, and biology, and psychology, and geography. They all took the same one. And then that changed for reasons that completely escaped me. I, I literally have no idea why it matters. But it was a weird thing. It was fine. So here's, this is actually, it was not unlike what we used to get back then. Because the biology program was very small back then. So it, would like, it might look like that. As you can see, the x-axis doesn't mean anything. Right? The psychology over here on the left, because it's the <coughs> most awesomest, and it's an awesome to shitty. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Is it, is it um, you know what it is? It's the order I put it into the program I used to do. It, just did it. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Right. People have a real problem with this um, when they look at One of the problems people have when you have a bar graph like this is they tend to interpret x axes as if they matter even if they're categories. That's a, it's actually a real issue. Because they don't, right? They just don't matter. They're simply categories. It can be even trickier. Sometimes those categories have numbers attached to them. Like TV channels, right? TV channels have numbers, but the numbers don't mean really anything. They technically mean things about frequency. Like channel two on Shaw Cable, that's the weather channel, right? 
Okay, channel three is the uh, is global. And I think CBC is channel six. So that means that CBC is three times the channel the weather channel is. And global is one better than the weather channel, but three poorer. That doesn't make any sense. But the problem is it's got numbers, and people look at that little numbers. Well, it's science. You can't argue with it. <laughs> That's not really how the world works. Getting kind of careful with that kind of stuff. It's so tempting. Whenever we see order of any sort, humans are just pattern recognizing machines. I mentioned this the other day. We love patterns. We have a whole part of our brain that recognizes faces, nothing else. That's why we see things like, hey, there's a man in the moon. Have you ever seen that face on Mars? There's no face on Mars. You're an idiot. What there is is a pattern that vaguely looks like a face, and you go, and your brain goes, big face. Right? So we see patterns, and go, oh, look at that. Psychology, way over there. Yeah, that actually means nothing. So if you want to do a pie chart, I don't know, there's a pie chart. I, I, they don't help me at all. But I think that's because I'm a scientist, so we don't use pie charts. They work for you. I wouldn't use it in a paper because most people go, what the hell are you using a pie chart for? All right. Yeah, quantitative variables, of course, we use a histogram. We can also see something called central tendency. The most sort of the average is one of the central tendencies. We can see the spread of something, how spread out the numbers are. Think of our quiz scores, they're pretty tight and packed, except for that one close over at the end. We can see the shape. And in fact, central tendency and spread and shape are really the key three things we want to know about a distribution. So we can describe shape like this. We can talk about a distribution having a skew. We can say it could, be, it could be negatively skewed, or it could be positively skewed. And everybody always says, that doesn't look right. Well, you know, it doesn't matter what you think what things look like. That's negatively skewed. That's positively skewed. And if you want to remember how, Here's a helpful mnemonic. The tail tells the tale. Also, kill me because I said that. But actually, you'll never forget it. Though. I will say that Cheryl Wayne Elder told me that once, and I said, I hate that, but I'll never forget positively negative skewed <laughs> ever again. So this is this is a negative skew, even though you might think, well, why are they all over here? That's it's talking about tail. It's not talking about most of the mass of the function. Just because you don't know what words mean doesn't mean that it should all then change around you. You don't just say, well, this isn't a table anymore. I'd like to call that milk. You, you can't do that. What does that mean? Well, they used to. Remember back when literally meant literally? And now we look at the dictionary, it also means figuratively. And then it makes me want to just kill myself. It's like, well, that's it, I quit. The world's become an anti intellectual cesspool. <laughs> I gotta do something to keep this crap interesting, okay? And the way I do it is I just say things like anti intellectual cesspool, which is also the name of my punk band. <laughs> of course, it's not our name. Um, I have never been a punk band. I've been in a band. I can play bass. I'm not a bass player. I can play bass. There's a difference. I'm really shitty at it. That's the difference. So we know it's skewness. People do talk about that. There's nothing wrong with that. Just remember what it means. It usually means exactly the opposite of what it, for somehow intuitively. <coughs> skewness talks about the tail, not about the mass of the scores. We can talk about kurtosis. 
Kurtosis, I had a case of kurtosis once. They treated that patient. It's perfectly fine. We'll see without ointment. An ointment. Just like say ointment. Um, something leptocurtic, it means it's peaked. It's leptocurtic. Platocurtic means it's flat. So you would say, for example, that Dwayne Keogh is leptocurtic, whereas Paul Dupuis is platocurtic. <laughs> Paul will like this joke. He'll get me back, I don't care. Um, oh, please tell him, yeah. <laughs> I believe I've, I've used that before, I've used it like said. <laughs> Good, good one last time. <laughs> that probably makes a really offensive blind joke. <laughs> so, this is a, by the way, this is one of those ones that I never can remember. I know what kurtosis is, it's just how spread out how fat or how thin the distribution is, so how Keogh-like or Dupuy-like it is. But it doesn't say anything else. Like, oh, it says other things. There are actual measures of kurtosis. And there are measures of skewness. And I have no idea how to calculate them or how to interpret them. Most people don't. Most people look at these things and say, it's skewed this way. Kurtosis is like this. When they say kurtosis, they say how thin or how fat is something. Okay. Holy kurtosis, Batman! We're positively skewed. All right. So that's ways we can describe shape. Uh, we should talk about distribution in symmetrical or asymmetrical order, right? So a skewed distribution is symmetrical. So it means if you cut it down the middle, it's the same on both sides, right? It could be unimodal or bimodal. <coughs> bimodal distributions, um, speaking of STAT 2126, the ultimate bimodal distribution course, when the course starts. You give the first quiz in STAT 2126, and I kid you not, your distribution looks like this. Literally. People frightened, people going, yeah, okay. Very often your first, uh, if you teach an intro level course of anything, right after you go to high school, the first test, very often, the first test you ever had right was intro psych. It was like three weeks in September, maybe four, right? Last week of September, you're like, it's, it's, this is with 28% of my final grade? It's 30 questions, what? And you're scared shitless. And some, you know, you know, some of the class are up your students and they're like, you know, whatever, we are fine. Some of the class, they just get it, and then some of the class are like, I don't know what to do. Also, some of them don't belong to university and they're just there. Please love my dad. She's a girlfriend with their vet school, I guess I'll go to. Right? You get that. Find a little distribution. Eventually, you get, you know, in almost every course you teach. But some courses, very often, especially as an introductory ones, they start like that. You don't usually see anything other than unimodal or bimodal. You're not going to see a trimodal. You've never seen such a distribution. I guess it could happen. We could have a uniform distribution. Each score being equally as likely. Give me an example. When would you get a uniform distribution? Simpler example. Please. Did you do like a golden save percentage? No, 
Yeah, goalie save percentages, though, the thing is, they tend to, again, some are better than others. Yeah. Right? They're all, anybody below 900 plays in the AHL or goes to Europe. Uh, <laughs> that's what happens. Um, and then everybody, everybody over what, 920 is a starter. Right? Uh, you can look at something like PDL or hockey, which is save percentage plus shooting percentage. Yeah. It should be around 100. Yeah. Oh, you know the hockey analytics? Because that's very cool that you know that. You and I can discuss that rest of the class. <laughs> um, yeah, course of four, course of the games. But it's not it's something simpler. Curtis. Bingo. The chance of We're not playing bingo. I don't know. What, sorry, yes, go ahead. <laughs> no, the chance of drawing the numbers. Perfect. Nice example. Nice example. The chance of drawing each number in bingo. I got an even simple one, have a rolling a die. <laughs> because in many ones, it's twos, it's threes, it's fours, it's fives, it's sixes, it's exactly the same principle as bingo. They should all be the same. Because if they aren't, in fact, someone's screwing with your bingos. Some old guy's in there waiting your balls. Right? Oh, I got 17 again. I wonder how that happened. Bingo. That's the old guy who cheated. That was my impression of old cheating bingo guy. I haven't brought him out yet, it's first time, and I'm just workshopping at this point. So you could be uniform distribution, they're pretty rare. They tend to be in things like oh, flipping a coin would be uniform. Heads and tails. I like your appeal to hockey statistics though. Um, here's an example. Oh, speaking of hockey, I picked some years of Mario Lemieux's career. Mario Lemieux is the best pure goal scorer in the history of hockey. I doubt any of you remember seeing him play very much. You might have seen the end of his career when he, you know, when he came back. You didn't see him in his hey, though. Know. He was ridiculous. He was so good. There he is, our Olympic team in 2002. Everybody always said he looks slow. Yeah, it's because he's six foot six. He's faster than everybody else in the US. One stride for him is about one and a half for everybody else. Okay, here's some goal totals for totals for Mario Lemieux. In his first year, he's only 18, and so he scored 43 that year. 43, 48, 54, 70, 85, 45, 19. Oh, he got hurt. Got hurt. He had a bad back for his career. 44, 69 is a good year. Back again, 17. 69. 50, this is an interesting year because he took six weeks off to have cancer. That's it. Yeah, six weeks off, he had Ron Hodgkin's lymphoma, took six weeks off, still won the league scoring title. Yeah, I got a touch of cancer, I could take six weeks off. <laughs> and then eventually the back stuff caught up with him, he quit. And he bought the team, he bought the Pittsburgh Penguins. He owns the Pittsburgh Penguins. He bought them because, well, he won them in basically, he either, they either said, well, you owe him all this money and we paid him. So you can either give all the assets of the team, or he'll sue you and say, I'll take the team. Really? Yeah. And then in 2000, 2001, he had retired. He's in the Hall of Fame. He retires. His number is hanging from the rafters in Pittsburgh. And he's like, he starts skating with the team. It's a voice been skating with the team. And yet, Jeremy Yager at the time was the, probably the best player in the world. And he, he said, Yager, what's it like being the greatest goal scorer in, in hockey? He said, I don't know. You should ask our owner what it's like. And then, like, two weeks later, these rumors started to come around. And then, the next thing you know, oh, look who plays for the team. The owner. It was bizarre. And he didn't miss a beat. It's like, yeah, I'm fine. He came back that year, he scored 28 goals in about 35 games. He came third in the NHL and scored. Like half a season. How is the Augur still playing? Uh, he's almost finished. Now. I don't know, he's 45, but he's only seven years younger than I am. Whereas Mario's my age. In fact, I think, yeah, we're born the same year, 65. He's only 45? Yeah, yeah, he's only 45. I wish we would bring the hair back. Yeah. Oh yeah, he, had, he, had, he invented hockey. <laughs> but it was, it was an incredible thing. And then he came back and led our Olympic team in the first one. I mean, all I'm saying is, I don't care if you don't like hockey and cultural whatever, he was a hell of a hockey player. 
So it's a beauty, just a beautiful thing to watch him play. Look up a goal. In fact, there's a goal you can see from 2002 in the Olympics where he's going in the net, and it looks like he's going to take a pass, and he doesn't, and it completely confuses the American goalie. And it's just as wonderful. So Mario was a good hockey player. And he now still owns the Pittsburgh Penguins. We can histogram these things, but we maybe want to group the values somehow. So instead of like each individual score, so this is what I've done here. I just had to do a brute histogram. And you might, what the hell, what's with 90? You never scored 90? Yeah, but it's between 85 and 95. Okay? 85 and 94, sorry. So the midpoint. Okay. One of the things, and right away, in fact, even if you didn't know anything about hockey, you can look at that and you'd say, there's something very strange about this guy, because most of the time he scores at least 50, around 50 goals, which if you, if you do know about hockey, that's a benchmark. But even if you don't, you might say, that seems like a lot, and there's a lot on the other side. There's a whole bunch over to the far left. Does this guy hurt a lot? Like, you'd be able to feel that right away just by looking at those numbers, right? Or did he miss a lot of games for some reason? Yeah, bad back, back, and also the cancer year. I had him in my hockey pool that year, and I wouldn't drop him. It's like, well, I'm going to look at him. I'll keep him. The problem was a buddy of mine had Scott's, uh, sorry, Kevin Stevens and Mark Recky, who were his line mates. And as soon as Mario came back, they each got two points for everyone Mario got. They each got a point for this. It was an incredible year. I remember the year that 87, Canada Cup, before the World Cup, and then I was at a game, Canada against Sweden, Montreal Forum, and Canada's power play comes out, and the poor Swedish goalie looks up, and it's Messier centering, centering the, uh, um, um, the Mio and Gretzky, and on the points it's Paul Coffey and Raymond Bork. And the, the poor Swedish goalie is like, um, autographs before we start, <laughs> that's not all possible, <laughs> be a thing. They scored in like 30 seconds. You still watch the Mio, and he'd stand it. At the far end of the, I'm not going on a lot of the hockey. I don't care if you don't like it. So if the net's right there, he'd be like right perpendicular to me. And he'd tell guys where to pass the puck. It's like he was playing PlayStation. He'd go. And he'd, like, he'd be directing things. That puck would come here and go, oh yeah, like that. And he'd score. God, he's just beautiful to watch. So at the midpoints, that's why you see the 90. You can never score 90 goals in the air. Only one person's ever done that. That was the aforementioned Mr. Gretzky. Now, you have to make sure that scale makes some sense whenever you make a histogram. Especially the y-axis. Especially the y-axis. I remember this happening when I lived in Newfoundland, and um, uh, who sent it in? I think it was from the electrical company. And they wanted, most people in Newfoundland heat their homes either with wood or with oil. Okay? They don't, hit, they don't use natural gas. There's no natural gas. It's just, Newfoundland just, you know, gets natural gas and sends it somewhere else. And so there's, there's no actual no, no natural gas uh, pipes within the province. So the oil company always wants to switch to oil. Which is a pain you know, you're in your Or the electrical company wants to push for electric. Okay. So we get this thing in the mail, and it's got this graph. And it says oil. Yeah, but 
the graph's actually accurate, just that they're screwing you with the axis, right? But they're, they're, they're saying, oh yeah, the origin, we're not gonna put the origin in. We'll start it at uh, 99, and the lowest will be 100. And that's what happened. I believe also they spelled electric with a C, with a, with a line through it, with money. Like, it was just gorgeous. You'll see this in political campaigns, by the way, all the time. All three parties, they all do it. Misuse of, 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 of numbers like that is, is a tremendous thing that's done in political campaigns. But it's also done in advertising all the time. But I admittedly have seen people do this at conferences, and I've asked the question, can you go back to your graphs, please? Yeah, that looks like it's five times as much, but what's the origin there? And they say, and they say, why is it like that? I don't know the computer did that. It's like, oh, okay. Does that happen? So you've, the histogram of the group data, like I with Margaret and his goal goals, we've lost richness in the data. It's probably okay with a big data set, right? If, if we had, <coughs> excuse me, every player in the NHL's goal totals uh, for each season over the last 20 years, you'd see this really big decline, actually, because there's less goal scoring in these Because goalies are better, and coaches are better. Everybody's a smoke. <laughs> it really changed the game. Um, but with a small data set, you probably don't want to lose the richness if you can avoid it. So you could use something like a stem and leaf plot, or a stem plot, as it's sometimes called. So I made a stem and leaf plot of those numbers that we had before. You see how this works, right? 1, 6, 7, 17, 19, 28, 35, 43, 44, 45, 48, 50, 54, 69, 77, 85. I hope those are the same numbers. If they have, aren't, and I have miscopied them, I have miscopied them, and just get over it. Now, I hope you understand the point of what I've done, right? This is something you can have automatically done in almost any kind of stats, definitely any kind of stats program, but most of your uh, spreadsheet programs are this thing. Right. Nice thing is, turn your head sideways, you've got a distribution. Nice thing is, you've got all the numbers. Yes? Why aren't there like, like coffee taps in classrooms? Talk to my union. So this is called an ordered stem and leaf plot. You can also put them with numbers not in order. I don't know why you would do that, but it exists. So you interpret like a histogram. It's easy to spot outliers, also known as spot. Spot. This is like, it's like electric company, like the show you've ever seen. Spot, spot. Spot. Preserves all your data, it's all there. It's also easy to get the 50th percentile, the middle number. In our case, this is going to be 44. How did I do that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. If there's 17 numbers, there should be 8 on either side and 1 in the middle, correct? That wasn't magic Dave arithmetic. I'm not right man. Let me, let me 8 on each side, yeah. I have a walker. I can make autism jokes all I want, my son has autism. And I make them to him. And he's in the plane crashes, he can tell me when Qantas crashed. <laughs> I seem so callous and horrible, though. Now and then I'll look at him, he doesn't look so much anymore because he's not, he's not little and he knows I'll figure it out, but sometimes like, if he doesn't like something, I don't sort of look at you and go, ah, and look at him and say, don't you pull that autism shit on me. 
And he goes, oh, sorry. Yeah. Like, you got me. You got me. Okay, you're right. Yeah, I just uh, kind of screwed around there. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> yeah, there are times when it's perfect. It's just like with my vision. When I'm at a big airport going through security, excuse me, I'm, I'm blind. Can you help me? Oh, you want to go through this special quick thing for disabled people? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> or when John's Xbox broke a few years ago, so I did it for uh, repair. I emailed to, there's actually a web, uh, uh, an email address that Microsoft has. Uh, I think it's called advocate at Microsoft.com. I emailed that and I said, my son has autism and we interact over Xbox Live a lot. Got it back the next day. Oh yeah. My dad once got us better since at a Montreal Expo game because I was blind. So I can't see the ball. Can we down there? <laughs> he was almost blind, eh? <laughs> Look, he's got some sort of advantage. Right? I'm just saying. Me. It's funny. A couple of years last year, I came back after my sabbatical, so no one knew me. No one knew me. And I was, I was going to hand back some assignments, and I hadn't got them done. You know me, I get things back very quickly, and I hadn't got them back the next day, and someone said, You have any test mark yet? I said, No, I don't. My son has autism, and I'm blind. <laughs> and they all looked at me like, That's really not an excuse. They just did that for fun. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm such a jerk. Um, but you see how I did that? It's like it's the middle. Eight and eight and the one in the middle. Let's go eight. <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, four, four. It's the one in the middle. It's the 50th percentile. Right? Make sense? Okay. Oh, those all came up at once. Okay. Uh, so, the, the, the median, or the 50th percentile, is part of what's called the five number summary. This is a way to summarize some stuff about some data. You got the median, you got the first quartile, which is the 25th percentile, which is the median of the first half. Okay? You get the third quartile, which is the median of the second half. And how did I get 0.5? Well, I've got nine numbers in each, right? So we're going to middle. And then you get the minimum and the maximum. You'd never present these things in an article. You'd never talk about them in a talk. You'd never, it, that's it, not what this stuff is for. What it's for is so that you can understand your own number. That's what this is for. minimum and the maximum. So in our case, the minimum is 1, maximum is 85. Between those two, you can get what's called the range. This is the lamest of all measures of spread, is the range. Because if you call it 84, 85 minus 1, you can say it's 1 to 85. Right? It would be like our example with those quiz grades, 10 to 35 or 25. It's, all it's, it, it, it's the least precise of all possible spread evenness measures. Okay? The least precise of all. Yeah, stop trying to move. You guys watch a movie? Or? No. It's not kidding. I did it. But I imagine you're paying attention. I'm going to guess that's what you're doing. And if you're not, I'm not going to care. 
Um, <laughs> so the five that we're separating allows you to do something else. You can make a box and whisker plot. Whisker. Cool whip. It's so great that my son's gotten got into family guy recently because he watches videos at all hours of the evening and the day and everything. Sometimes I'll wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I'll hear from his room just watching Family Guy. Mm. It's like, well, at least I was woken up by something that didn't make me angry. Because his taste in music means a lot to be desired. I applaud the fact that he just listens to everything, but most music's shitty. I mean, of all genres of all eras, right? Of course, he's like, yeah, this is great. Katy Perry. <laughs> He actually, is, at 16, has come to a realization that comes to most people when they're 35. Who cares if you don't like what my music is? I like it. Screw you. I just don't want to care. Care, care very much. So box plots are great because they give you an idea of the shape of the data. Hey, look, here's one now. How did I do this? I don't know. I think I drew it. I think I drew it. But I did it with the five number summary. Minimum, there's the one. Maximum, first quartile, third quartile, median. I think I Googled how to do it with Excel, which took about 300 steps. It was really hard. Like, there wasn't a way to do it easily with Excel. And maybe now, in a newer version, I did this a few years ago, so I think it's a newer version. There's also, um, but if he's like SPSS or something, it's trivial. In SPSS, there's a um, section, if you, like I said, I said the other day, just play with SPSS, so people that play with it, put some data in, and then you go to uh, analyze, and then descriptive, and then you can just choose, I don't want to see box pop, sure. Just goes around with it. So you can see here, this has got some value, you would never present this in a paper. I've maybe seen it once in a talk, a bunch of bars. Yeah. That was once. Right. But this is telling us something about, look at this. These, this. This here tells us that there are more scores bunched together here than there are here, right? So up here between the median and the third quartile, between the second quartile and the median. Okay. There's a couple of ways to do the whiskers. One of them is to take put this this here between the third and second, sorry, third and first quartile. It's called the interquartile distance or the IQD. Um, one of the ways to do it is do one and a half IQDs from the median. So you go like that much, and that's obviously not what I did. Right? It actually works here, but not there. But you can do that. That's another approach. There's really, a lot of people say, oh, this is how you do it. There's only one way to do it. Not really. These are just for you, Eric, to allow you to get a feel for it. The idea of what an IQD is is always the same. It's Q3 minus Q2, or sorry, minus Q1. <coughs> But it's not like there's a rule. Books will say, do it like this. Books will say, do it like that. And you'll find different books say different things. This kind of thing is really just so you can get a feel for your numbers. All right, questions so far? I know this was just completely boring, especially the bits about hot. I don't care. I like hot. You're going to learn to love hot. You don't like it. It's better. Same. Maybe bonus questions about hot. Who's not going to be great? Okay, so um, the slide Mario could sort of play. Yeah. Okay, so like it says labels are midpoints and limits are 514, 85, 94. Real yeah. limits are, I just, I don't know what Oh, oh, the limits are just, the midpoints of that graph are telling you um, like where the middle is, and it's like 84 and a half to 94 and a half, I think it says something like that. 
That's what the real limits are, so it's between 85 goals and 95 goals. That's all okay. that means. Or 94 goals, sorry. So are there multiple limits? Like, why is there five goals? Because, no, because each, okay. be, between, yeah, there are different, between each category, there because are multiple limits. Because there's That's right. Okay. Yep. Yep. And you, you doing that? I just don't know what I'm asking. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, can you just, the IQD for the formal work? Interquartile distance? Yeah. Third quartile versus first quartile. Okay. Yep. Interquartile distance. Interquartile distance. Or range, that's another word you'll see. Interquartile range as well. Those are both fun. Those are both fun. Those are both fun. Okay. What's that? You okay? You guys are fine? Yeah. Okay. okay. We're talking about like PDO and state percentage and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. okay. You actually know about those things? I don't think any people know about hockey analytics. Yeah. It's a weird thing to know about. Not in depth. Well, I just would watch that one. I'm older than you, it's always. You know, the last time you said that, you know, the NHLers, person in our program, her father was on our Olympic team. Yeah. Taylor Felix's dad was on our Olympic team. Yeah. Yeah. In 1994, they won silver medal. Not gold. But he's yeah. got way more Olympic medals than I do. Infinitely more. I think we can throw that out. I don't know. Yeah, we can put it on eBay. Yeah. yeah. I'd buy it. Okay, so central tendency, a little bit we talked about. It's one of three properties really necessary to describe the distribution. We can talk about the shape, uh, ketosis, and all that stuff. So let's talk about, so consider the following. I don't know why I said it like that. It felt like a thing to do. Here are some numbers. 159-2030. Those are numbers. Oh, yes, they are. Here's some more numbers. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh, yeah, I know numbers. PhD. <laughs> they both have the same mean. For those of you who don't remember how to calculate a mean, well, they threw. Uh, not a kid, of course. Half kid. Um, right? Sum of all the scores divided by the number of scores. Sum of the x's over n. 1 to 5 is 6, and 9 is 15. 20, 35, 45 divided by 5, 9. Oh, yeah, that's good. 6 to 5, divided by 5, 30. Yay. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Mean is 13. So those, those two batches of numbers have exactly the same mean. One's more spread out than the other. Yeah. Talk when here's my first word out here. But they both have the same mean. So these two batches of numbers, one would say they are the same yet different. One could say that if one was a twist. Um, so there's our two batches of numbers again. So the same mean, and they're both symmetrical, by the way. So if we were going to say, are they symmetrical? Yeah, they are. They have as much on one side as the other. Both those th these things are both true, right? That's nice. How are they different? Well, how are they different? Tell me, how are they different? We just talked about that. One's more spread out than the other, right? So we want a way to measure spread outedness. So we need a way to measure spread outedness. How would we measure that? Well, the range is a start. It's a lame start, but it's a start. And in fact, you can see that one has a bigger range than the other. That's helpful, I guess, to a point. It's helpful. 1 to 30 versus 11 to 15. Or if you prefer, 29 versus 4. 
quick with that, with drags. You want something a little more granular, right? Yeah. A little more granular. A little more fine. It's pretty crude, this. It's, it works. It tells us something. One is more spread than the other, but it doesn't tell us a whole lot more. We can look at interquartile distances or something like that. We've only got five numbers now. It's kind of silly to do that. We could do it, though. An interquartile distance, in fact, or interquartile range is a measure of spread, and it could work here. It's a little more fine grain than range. It's true. It's still pretty crude, though. It's not going to get us very far. It's not going to get us very far. We need something better. Something that is kind of like a mean. Because with a mean of a bunch of numbers, we all know what that means. We all can say, okay, the arithmetic average or whatever, we got to calculate it. Pretty simple. We need like the average amount the data themselves are spread out. That's what we need. Well, let's do that. Let's get the average amount of data are spread out from the mean. How far on average each number is from the mean. So I'm going to quickly throw this up here. Don't worry about this too much, but I'm just going to sum the scores minus the mean. <coughs> so 1 minus 13, 5 minus 13, 9 minus 13, 20 minus 13, 30 minus 13, all divided by 5. Let's see, negative 12 plus negative 8 plus negative 4 plus 7 plus 17 is 0. Well, we know it's not, not spread out at all, so zero is not going to be very useful. This doesn't work. It can't work. And if you think about what the mean is, of course it can't work. The mean is like a balancing point. It's always going to give you as much on one side as it gives on the other, and it can't. If you did, if you ever calculate this and you get anything other than zero, You've made a mistake. It is literally impossible for this not to be zero with any batch of numbers. It's a property of the universe. Things just work that way. It can't not work that way. Right? So that's going to get us nowhere. That's always the intuitive thing. I know, in fact, when I when I taught stat 2126. I've often asked students, what would you do in this situation? They say, well, why don't we just subtract the difference, we get the difference rather from the mean and add them all up. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. You always get zero. So it must always sum to zero. And again, as I said, it makes sense when you think about this. It can't not sum to zero. It's impossible. Should be as, as I said, as much on one side as there is on the other, the mean is a balancing point. How do you get rid of negatives? Well, the easiest way to get rid of negatives is to take the absolute value. Right? You remember when you were taught absolute value in grade whatever it was, eight or nine or six or ten, I don't know if you teach that anymore. And you were said you were told, you said to yourself, I'm never literally ever going to use this. <laughs> You're using it right now. So for your math teacher in grade whatever it was, and, and you thought to yourself, I'm never going to use this, I say to you from that math teacher, ah! we get a quantity called the mean absolute deviation. All I've done is taking the, it gets rid of the negatives, it's all good. 12, 8, 4, and 7, 17, and 5, 4. Hey, look at that. That's a number. It's a non zero number. Yay! And I bet if we get it for the other ones, I'm not going to. Well, I could. I a second. The other ones, that's easy. The other ones, what? 12, 13, 14, 15. 2 and 1 is 3. 3 and 3 is 6. 6 divided by 5. The other one is 1. 2. Oh, look. The more spread out one has a bigger number than the less spread out one. 
I just instead use them. What for this? Yeah. Do you have some values? No, no, oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. If the other one's one point two, if you that was easy enough, right? Get on the head, right? It's pretty simple. The one that had was more spread. The other one was more spread. Has a bigger number. The one that's less spread out sounds great. It almost makes you feel like we've got somewhere. And this thing that has a name, the mean absolute deviation. And it's not useful at all. <laughs> the mean absolute deviation just isn't useful for our purposes. It actually is a real quantity, and it is used sometimes in what are called non-parametric statistics. We're not going to use a lot of it. There are cases where it, it, it is a measure of spread. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it, it is a statistical dead end. It is a statistical dead end. And I'm sure you went over this kind of thing in intro steps, right? That we could do it this way, it's intuitive, and it's beautiful, and it's pleasing, and it's useless. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's a dead end. It doesn't really get us anywhere. We need something that we can relate to all the other statistical techniques you're going to talk, we're going to talk about in this class. Okay. It has real intuitive appeal. It's a real shame. It's a real shame. All right, any questions on this stuff? I think that's enough for our first day, right? Thanks, guys. All right, so we were talking the other day about how the mean absolute deviation is actually a pretty useless tool for our purposes. Um, it has its uses, it just isn't in inferential statistics, the kind of statistics we're going to use. So we have to find out something that's going to work better. It has real intuitive appeal, and that makes it's a real shame that it doesn't work better. It's used more in things like, uh, well, non-parametric statistics, let's just say that. So there's got to be a better way. And of course, you know there is. And if there wasn't, we'd stop right now. <laughs> Course is over. Everybody go. Um, and the other way to get rid of negatives, because we have to get rid of them, because remember, if we just use the negatives, we end up always with zero, and we, the world just works that way. The other way, of course, is to square the deviations. So we're going to look at square deviations from mean. Okay. So negative nine squared is eighty-one. So any time you take, when you square a negative number, you get a positive number. Right. Remember, negative times a negative gives you a positive. Again, it's one of those things you learned in grade seven and thought, "I'll oh, never do this." Well, here it is. So we're getting closer to what we need at this point. Okay. So that's the batch of numbers, which was what, 1, 5, 9, 20, and 30. The average of those numbers is 13. So 1 minus 13 squared, 5 minus 13 squared, 9 minus 13 squared, 20 minus 13 squared, 30 minus 13 squared, 144 plus 64 plus 16 plus 49 plus 289. Right? We square all those numbers. Now we have so the square deviations from mean. Right? And we're going to sum them. We're going to get something called, you may have heard of this term before, a sum of squares. Right? That's where the term comes from because it's a sum of squares. It's a sensible term. You'll find for the most part in statistics, <coughs> the terms are sensible except for lepto kurdic and Dwayne heel kurdic or whatever it was. So, I told him about your joke. Good, do you like that? He said, how would you know you can't see? Excellent. <laughs> well, is that Paul or Dwayne? Paul. Good. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll get him back, don't worry. Yeah, it was more complimentary to Keel, I guess. It's going to happen now and then, I just, you know, by dumb luck alone, I'll give Keel a compliment. Uh, okay, we're friends. Divide that all by five, we get 112.4. Okay. 
five observations. That's why we're just getting the average, right? Sort of a, it makes sense to divide by the number of observations. Now, that seems like a mighty big number, considering all, none of those numbers, you know, you got <coughs> numbers like 13 and 20. None of them were that big, but remember, we've got a squared, the units, the, the units we're using are squared, right? Well, the, what we're going to do then is take the square root of that. So the opposite of squaring is something is taking the square root. Now, this is one of those cases where, by the way, it's easy to, it's easy to make mistakes doing these things with calculators. And that's because you're putting a whole bunch of numbers in. Right? You're putting a whole bunch of numbers into something, you're going to make mistakes. But when you look at something and go 112.4, the square root of that, you should look at that and say, what should that be? Well, it should be something between 10 and 11, probably, right? 10 squared is 100. So it's 10.6. So that looks like a sensible number, right? It has intuitive appeal. It feels like we have a number here. And going back to the MAD, what's the number for the mean absolute deviation? <coughs> just that batch of numbers again? Going back, do we have that just sitting in front of them? It was 9.6. What was it? 9.6. 9.6. So again, yeah, it, it feels right. Like it's the same kind of number. Like it's not an order of magnitude bigger or an order of magnitude smaller. It feels sensible, right? A lot of doing statistics is it just knowing formulas uh, and all that? In fact, a great uh, amount of it seems to me is having an intuitive feel for it. Does it make sense? Do these numbers make sense then? And that number makes some sense. There is, however, a real issue. When I say a little problem, it's actually, in somewhat, some respects, a rather big problem. And that's what I've shown you so far. That formula has n on the bottom, the number of observations. And that makes speaking of intuitive sense makes complete intuitive sense. But right? it really does. The problem is it should be n minus one. What? Yeah, it's supposed to be n minus one. Hmm. We want something that will be an unbiased estimator of the same quantity in a population. These aren't I have told you they're a population, and if I don't tell you something's a population, it's a sample. Right? That's the, the sort of general rule is that if it, unless you are sure it's a population, it's a sample. So there is some population of numbers that those numbers were drawn from. We want something that's an unbiased estimator of a population. We want what's called a statistic which is a number that describes a sample, that is an unbiased estimator of a population parameter, which is a number that is usually an unknown number that describes a population. Usually unknown, not always, but almost always. Because if you knew them, you wouldn't have to do the statistics now, would you? Right? If I knew what the population number was, why am I doing a sample? That would be stupid and a giant waste of everyone's time. Typically, population parameters, as they're called, are unknowable. Because if they were knowable, we wouldn't have to do statistics. Right? Think about when we do experiments. If I actually knew what happened in the population, why am I doing an experiment? I already know the answer. It would be silly for me to do an experiment. If I could say that I knew that the right half of the room did better on a memory test in the left half of the room, and I just knew that no matter all right halves and left halves of rooms, why am I doing the science then? It's a waste of my time. I just know that. But we don't know that. That's not how the universe works. We can't know things like that. When we do know things like that, people line up on Sundays and worship us. Or Thursdays or Fridays or Tuesdays or whatever day 
your belief system lines up to worship deities. Or doesn't. I don't know. I'm not trying to be offensive to anybody. I can be offensive. I can be extremely offensive, but not. I don't try to be. Let's just say that. I can do this at a class, give me a couple of drinks, and I can be exceedingly offensive. <laughs> Why specifically does is n minus one an unbiased estimate? This is it's an excellent question. Um, there's two ways to answer this. One way is that we can look at the math behind this, the really sort of deep math behind this, and show that it works that way. There are proofs that show this. And that's probably not exceedingly mm, pleasing for me to say that. But I can tell you that's true. The other thing is that numbers don't know where they come from. So this is more of an intuitive explanation. Numbers don't know where they come from. Numbers are ignorant. We have made, and numbers are free to vary as much as they feel like. Well, wait, what? The numbers don't feel like doing anything I know. But numbers can, are free to vary. So if we had, What are our numbers again? I forget what they are, but they add up to, it doesn't matter what they add up to. Let's go with a different set of examples so I don't have to remember what the numbers are. If we had the numbers uh, 10, 20, 40, 50. So that adds up to, so what's the mean of that? 30 and 40 is 70 and 50 is 120, right? So that adds up to 120. Divided by four, so the mean is 30. Okay. So if we had those numbers 10, 20, 40, 50, just double checking 90, 100, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130. Yes, okay. To calculate the standard deviation, as this thing is called, the variance in the standard deviation. What do I need? Well, formulas we know is this. X minus X. So X minus X bar squared over N minus 1. Let's worry about various screw standard deviation. We just have to take the square root. No big deal. What do I have to assume about these numbers? make that calculation. And a, ba a batch of, let's say, four numbers. What do I have to assume about? What have I done in advance? What have I calculated before I calculated this? Mean. Yeah. I have to calculate the mean before I calculate the standard deviation, yes? Or the variance. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands that, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it's actually in the formula. So there is one restriction on the, on the on that number, or on, on that formula. And that's that I, the numbers in this case have, have to add up to, in the example I've made up, they have to add up to 120. Right? They must add up to 120. Or they must add up to, if you want to get general, x times n. Sum of x is times the n. Times the n. OK. So if I had. Numbers. Give me a number. Okay, 15. Give me another one. 30. What was one? 30. 30 is good. Give me another one. 20. 20. Uh oh. This has to add up to 120. There's a restriction set here. So that's going to be, uh, let's see. It's 50, 65. It's going to have to add up to, it's going to be 55. Maybe that math correctly in my head. It must. It cannot be anything else. We could do this all day long. We shall not. But we could. 
If the numbers must add up to 120, that's a restriction that put on those numbers. That's how much they can vary. I can arbitrarily assign three values. The fourth one is fixed. By dividing by n minus 1, we're taking that into account. We're taking into account the fact that, that, that the numbers we're looking at their variance, we're really only looking at three of them, in a sense, not four, because the fourth one is fixed. No matter, or if in general, we are looking at n minus 1, not n. We have lost what is called a degree of freedom. Numbers have freedom to vary. And in samples, you have lost the degree of freedom because you have to fix the mean. You have lost the degree of freedom. Which leads to be one statistics joke, which is this one unbiased estimator meets up with another one in a bar. And he says, how do you like being married? And he says, it's OK as long as you don't mind losing a degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, done. So when you're dividing by n, it's you're using all four of the numbers. Well, yeah, and that's that's the population. Having the, so that's the full population. Yeah. Like the minus one is. It's it's a sample. We have to fix something. So we lost the degree of Yeah. Does that make some sense, Mitch? Good. Good. So numbers have freedom. Again, the numbers are ignorant. They don't know where they came from. Right. And we can arbitrarily assign n minus one of them. But the final one is fixed. The nth one is fixed. I remember all the way through intro stats. And at Western, when I was an undergrad, intro stats was a full year course, Psych 281. And I was always the guy going, yeah, but why? And I was always told the same thing. You'll learn this in 381, which is like this one. And I remember asking the prof after class, what are degrees of freedom? And he said, yeah. it's really beyond the scope of this course. And then I remember the next, which is actually a totally sensible example, because in an intro stats course, they're saying, this is a t-test, this is a z-test, this is sky-squared. Do this now. You have to learn that first. I think if you were taught this first, it would actually make your life more comfortable. Not you guys. You guys got through to uh, 2126. But I think the vast majority of people in 2126 would go, what? Numbers are free? Free the numbers, man. I mean, I, th I think people would be really confused. So the reason why, because a lot of people get to this course and go, well, why didn't they tell us this in 2126? Or why was it just, you were told, the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. Just remember that. It isn't quite this one is thing. Number of arbitrarily arbitrary values minus the number of things you fix. It's the freedom numbers have to vary. In 2126, saying it's n minus 1, just remember that, is a really sensible thing to do. It's not sensible. It, it's, it's, right, it's sensible, and it's short form, and it's fine. It's like when you learn, do you remember in like grade, 11, grade 10 science when you learned that atoms had a, had a the nucleus and it was made up of protons and, and neutrons, and then around them were orbiting electrons like planets. And you thought, oh yeah, that's cool. And then you get to like your upper year science class and you're told, yeah, it's not really true. It's a perfectly good model. It's wrong, but it's a perfectly good model. Actually, we have electron probability clouds. And you're sitting there thinking, I'm glad you didn't teach me that in grade nine. Electron probability clouds, right? So it's the same kind of thing. That's why you, you sort of taught this at a little more deeper level now, because you probably, most of you, probably, yeah, probably not you guys, most people will be going, I'm scared. Numbers can't vary on their own. So this is why we get, we're estimating the population with a sample. We have to divide by the number of degrees of freedom, not by the number of observations. I hope that helps. And like I said, when you play with this, actually with the proofs behind all this stuff, which, if you're lucky in graduate school, you'll be told this. Here's a proof. Make sense to you? Great. If not, I wouldn't worry about it. That's how I was taught it in grad school. 
they can show you their poof if you like, but you don't really want to see it. And then Ian Spence would make a blind jump because he was like that. You probably couldn't see it anyway, could you? Because he was awesome. All right. So the population parameters vary. It's the standard deviation of n on the bottom because you're actually looking at the real numbers, the actual numbers that are in the population. The sample statistics, population parameters, sample statistics. P and P go together, S and S go together. Are you used to estimate them have n minus 1, the number of degrees of freedom on the bottom, not the number of observations? Yeah, when you're in grad school, those proofs will be in your book. And as I said, if you're lucky, your prof just goes here, whatever. There's proofs there. Enjoy it. And that's my view of this kind of stuff, too. We're using this. We aren't doing statistics for the sake of it. We're doing it as a tool, using it as a tool. I encourage questions like Mitch's. That's a good question. OK. They would actually underestimate the population parameters if they had n underneath. The nice thing is we know how much y. And if we use degrees of freedom rather than actual number of observations, it fixes that. So we end up with an unbiased estimator, not a biased estimator. A biased estimator would consistently overestimate or underestimate, depending on the estimator, a population graph. An unbiased estimator overestimates as much as it underestimates. It doesn't get it dead on. It'd be great if it got it dead on. Our universe doesn't work that way. All right. Questions? By the way, the thing working with n minus 1 works really only if you have a, technically, works only if you have a random sample. <coughs> you never have a random sample. But it works well enough that you can violate the crap out of that assumption. You can violate it so much that it doesn't matter. OK. So there's the sample statistics. S squared is the sum of the x minus x bar squared over n minus 1. And then the square root of that quantity is s. It's funny. You think that s would be the one we'd like all the time. You'll find out in this course that we hardly ever really talk about standard deviation. We talk about variance all the time. That's the way it is. We'll talk about S. We use S when we do things like t-tests. That's about it. We tend to worry about variance more. Okay. <coughs> you ever notice there's like nails in the roof on their way in? I don't like that. Okay. Notice that now. I'm fine with it. Mike Holmes would come in when he came here and go, you know, it's a real shame because it's not up to cold. <sighs> Get out the whole thing. <sighs> All right. So in our case, our standard deviation, now we're divided by 4. We end up with 11.85 for our standard deviation. OK, great. Yay. So that's what we would end up with. By the way, if you have a calculator that does stats, which one you might, it might have very strange things written on. Like for example, my, my calculator, which I still use, I bought literally the first day I started graduate school. My TA for my graduate stats class bought it for me because I had no money on me. And there wasn't, there was a time when you used these papery things called money instead of just using your phone and your fingerprint. Um, I was at the UFT bookstore, and I was like, I didn't have enough money. My stats TA, who I didn't even know yet, he said, you're one of the new psych students. I said, yeah. He said, are you buying that for the class? I said, the stats class, yeah. He said, I'm your TA. Uh, pay me back first class. And, he bought, bought me. and I did pay him back. He's now the chair of the psych department at Dartmouth uh, College in the States. Uh, my friend Todd. And it has funny notation on it such that when it's doing standard deviations, which you can do, it has two. It has, let's say, variance. It's sigma squared sub n and sigma squared sub n minus 1. Um, that's, I guess, OK. That's because sigma is the population parameter. Right? 
That makes literally no sense. It should just be s squared. So sometimes you'll see sigma squared of n minus 1 on the calculator. And you don't do a population parameter with n minus 1 on the bottom. That's a sample statistic. So you might see that on your calculator. Don't do that. Calculators are made by calculator people, not by statisticians. So my calculator actually has that, and it's wrong. Like, it's, it's literally, the, it's the, the button's labeled incorrectly, which drives me insane. Is it the right calculation? Oh, the calculation's fine. It's just, it's like, that's not a thing. Sigma squared to n minus 1 actually isn't a thing. Maybe it was cheaper than making the S template. Maybe. It'd be funny, though. Like, Greek letters would be cheaper than the S's? I don't know. <laughs> Population, as I said, looks like that. Sigma, sigma squared. Big X minus mu squared. Big X's uh, the capital letters mean that you're using actual population values. And mu is a population parameter for the mean. And big N is the number of members of the population. So we estimate sigma squared with S squared. We estimate sigma with S. Questions so far? Makes sense, right? And I think it's stuff you probably ready to. Give me something where we would know, be able to know the population parameter for, for the mean. Okay, that's right. Perfect. Uh, popular, pop, where's something where we would actually know the population parameter for me? Yeah, IQ is one example because the tests are designed at the mean of, of, of 100. Actually, they have a standard deviation of 50 and variance of 225. What's something else? Well, we actually know mu. Let's not even worry about sigma, sigma and sigma squared because the <coughs> few I can think of are IQ and IQ. What is something where we would know the population parameter for the mean? Think of anything? Marks in this class. If you think of the class as a population, one could. I'm thinking like voting on some aspect. That's actually nice because, in fact, with in elections, they, what they're doing is they're estimating not means, they're estimating proportions, uh, which are P's or capital. P's and then the proportion in the population is a big letter phi. Um, yeah, I mean, we actually know the values there. Okay. We, we get those after the election. Right. We have the estimates. And then the, the estimates, of course, have a confidence interval, plus or minus so many percentage points, then times like 20. Yeah. yeah. And that's where random, sam and random sampling is, of course, important. Or, in fact, not so much random sampling, but representative sample. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's not a mean, though. But it's a good example. <laughs> You think of mean that we need to know the population parameters for? The under IQ. Like Jeez, it's hard, isn't it? census, I guess that's possible. But that's just a snapshot of the day the census was done. June 10th, 2016, I think, was the day the census was done. Hmm. This is hard. It's hard to think of something. We can imagine there is a mean for something. But actually knowing it is really, really hard. But again, any possible examples? Yeah. We could look at something like a difference score. A uh, difference between the 
by Q if people, let's go with IQ again. No, let's not use IQ. I get so sick of using IQ. The difference in 100 meter running speed between people who live in Sault Ste. Marie and Brandon, Manitoba, it's probably zero on average, right? We can theoretically, you, in fact, you can theoretically imagine it should be zero. It should be zero. There's probably some people with really good wheels in Brandon and probably some slow people. There's probably some people with really good wheels in Sault Ste. Marie and probably some slow people. Because Brandon's about the same size as the suit, right? I think. I don't know. Let's pretend. Jeez, I don't know. So you can, things like that, I can imagine where we could say it would be zero, a different score of some sort. You know, like when you set up a null hypothesis. Yeah, I can imagine that being something, but I can't sit there and think, what's the average height of a human in inches or centimeters? I don't know. I can guess something, but I don't know that it's true, and I wouldn't put any stock, I wouldn't bet on it. I, can, I would be willing to put down some money on the Brandon versus Sault Ste. Marie running competition that on average it works out to be a difference of zero. But, oh boy, I, I can't even think of anything. I can, like I said, differences, yeah, okay. So that's hard enough. Besides IQ, if you think of anything, oh, wait a second, here's one. Average roll of a die. There's an easy one. Three and a half, done. I can do that. There's six different possible rolls. One and two is three, three is six. Or it's 10, and then 15, 21, divided by 6. Should it be 3 and a half? I think so. Okay. Sure. Oh, the average, if we assign 1 to heads and 0 to tails, the average coin flip should be 0.5. Yeah, sure. Okay, those are easy. Yeah, really useful too. But I can, I can imagine them at least. I can, I can theoretically say, with some certainty, I think, if we've got a fair coin or a fair die, I can make some, okay. Standard deviations are hard. It's really hard to imagine what a standard deviation can do. You can actually do it with a binomial expansion. There's a reason we do statistics, because we don't know population parameters, and they're almost always complete, they're almost always unknown. In fact, sometimes you'll see a definition, like a definition of population parameter is an unknown number that describes a population. And that's a quite nice definition of a, of a population parameter. The reason we talk about IQ tests so often in intro stats classes is it's one of the few things where we actually know the population parameters because the tests are designed that way. Right. But the world typically does not work that easily. <coughs> All right. Questions so far? Good. So how are the variance in the standard deviation affected by extreme scores? Extreme. Kumar, I think. Um, so 1, 5, 9, 20, 30, those are our numbers, right? It's our batch of numbers. Standard deviation, if you remember, was 11.85, assuming I copied that correctly. If I didn't, whatever it calculated that would be. Let's throw our new number, 729. Why not? Sure, 729. So it's 1, 5, 9, 20, 30, 729. Our new mean is 132.33. And remember, the standard deviation is going to be affected by the mean. Look at the formula. It's got it up here. It's right here. Our new variance is uh, 8,555.067. Sorry, 85,555.067. And our new standard deviation is 292.5. Oh. I think it's affected it.
So the mean is affected by extreme scores. If the mean is affected, so of course is the standard deviation, the variance, because it's actually in the formula. You're putting a bigger number on top in the numerator of a fraction. You put a bigger number in the numerator, you get a bigger number. Right? We've done hardly anything to the denominator. It's not up by one. Numerator's not up by lots. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind. <coughs> now, one can make the argument that that's an outlier if you want. There's really no definition of outlier. You'll see people who write definitions. I always think of an outlier as a weird number that doesn't belong. That's, I mean, Really, because you'll see all kinds of, there's four standard deviations from the mean, or whatever, I don't know. It's weird and doesn't belong, is the one that I like. Again, exploratory data analysis, it's for you. It's not, it's not for anybody else. So how do we use this to our advantage? Well, our advantage might be a little strong way to put it, but there's a thing called the coefficient of variation. So we look at some data by Katz et al. from 1990, and I believe this is from the book. Um, boy, that's slow, eh? So, we have people studying or not studying and then writing a test. I forget, in fact, what the test was on. Let's say it was theoretical physics. I don't know. Let's look that up. When people study, for me, it's 69.6. That's good. Assuming it's at 100, that's pretty good. When people don't study, that means lower, around 50. That's not good. The standard deviation is 10.6 when people study. And it's only 8, 6.8 when they don't study. So are you telling me, if we were to just interpret this based on, let's say you ignore the means for a second. If we're to interpret this based solely on the standard deviations, we're saying there's more variation in performance when you study. Wait, what? How is that possible? Why would there be more variation in performance when you study? That would be weird. Well, you could study and still do pretty bad. Well, of course, yeah. But you can also study and still do pretty well. Like, why, why would there be more variance? It just seems strange. It's counterintuitive. It would be a strange thing if, in fact, if I, if I said to you, if, if you came to me for some advice, you're not doing great in class, and you said, how can I do better? Well, the first thing you can do, you're going to get more variance if you study. So I'd stop studying. Because you're going to be all over the place if you study. What? You would walk out of my office going, he's insane. Which I think many of you do. But you might throw in, he's more insane. And that's when I put my feet up, light a cigar, and go tenure. <laughs> um, actually, lighting the cigar would probably get me fired. Putting my feet up and saying tenure wouldn't. But lighting a cigar would kill you now. Actually, saying the word cigarette inside a, a building in Canada literally gets you fired. <laughs> Close. <laughs> we went from one extreme where people smoked everywhere. There used to be a sign in here because an old elite said no smoking, which tells you something. That means people used to smoke in here. When there ever has to be a no smoking sign, it tells you something. It tells you that people used to think, oh, can I smoke in here? Because the default position of the world was, well, I'm awake. I guess I should start smoking. I've told some of you guys this, that when I was at Westford as an undergrad, you could smoke in the library. There were study carols that actually had ashtrays built in. You couldn't bring food in. Please don't bring in any cheese ritz. But open flames? They're great around books. <laughs> Strangest thing, right? And then now if you see people, you know, 
25 meters outside a building of smoking, you'll see people walk, walking by, you know, you're worse than Hitler. So it's, <laughs> I don't know, a happy medium. I haven't smoked in a long time. I'm just saying that I never wanted to be, when I quit smoking, that this guy. Now I'm going to hate smoking. It's like, yeah, go down and smoke all you want. Just don't do it in class. That's a little weird. Maybe a pipe. Maybe a professor. Like, right? Be very good professorial to smoke a pipe. Or just weird. Okay, this is in my way, and I'm going to hit it. So we're going to make sure we're here. I'm not going to throw it. So I'm not a room here. Not like NW200 where I can just throw chairs. <laughs> Many of you have seen me do that. You haven't seen me when I walked in, into the clear podium when they put it in there. Yeah, put the clear furniture in there for the blind guy. Funny! It's a Helen Keller joke for Christ's sakes. Anyway, the coefficients of variation, or the CVs if you will, what this does is we're taking the standard deviation divided by the mean. We're standardizing it. It's affected by the mean. Why not divide by that value? And you see, in fact, that these numbers are almost identical, which is telling you that this variance in the variance, whoa, their inception okay. is simply due to the fact this means bigger. You'd never present, or you wouldn't, I shouldn't say never. Rarely would you present a coefficient of variation in a paper or a talk or something. But when you would see something like that, you might make, might make you wonder. So what you do is you just calculate this. Dividing by the standard, standard deviation, sorry, standard deviation by the mean to get standardized. That's all. Okay, so standard deviation by the mean. That's all that is. All right, just a couple of key points. Remember, we want to learn about samples and our populations. I mean, we want to learn about populations. We want to guess. We want to make estimates <coughs> about them. And the only way to do that is by learning about samples. We estimate population parameters with sample statistics. We want unbiased estimates of parameters. That's what we want. We can't calculate population parameters except under very specific circumstances. Um, as Curtis said, if we thought of everybody in this class, this class being a population, and then I was to have the same average grade of each person in this class, that's a population. But why would that be an interesting population, right? When I'm comparing, when I compared, for example, years ago, was me recording my lectures and releasing this podcast, and it actually helps students' grades, because one of the reasons I was doing this uh, was to increase students' grades, was it actually increasing their grades, um, I need to think of each class as a population. I thought of them as a sample. Right? And it did, 6.1 points. So. I haven't done it since, but it did. So we want to learn about populations, but we can't directly measure them. So we learn about samples, and then we make estimates of populations. All right. Now, here's something I just have to throw in at the end. I know it just seems like, wait, what? Okay. 
Couple bits of notation. First of all, E and then parentheses means the expected value of. An expected value is a long-term average, or what we would expect is an infinite number of what we call it statistics and probability experiments. Okay? So the expected value is what you would get with an infinite number of experiments. And an experiment in statistics and probability is just calculating something. So what's the expected value of x plus k? x is a variable, and k is a constant. Well, the expected value of x is x bar, right? The expected value of something is its average. Does that make sense so far? So if I was to add k to that, k is a constant, it doesn't change. The expected value now becomes x bar plus k. Because what's the expected value of a constant? Well, it, the constant. It's like, so what's the expected value of 7? Well, it's 7. No matter how many times you say 7, it's still 7. So if our mean was 10, and we added 7 to every score, we should now expect 17. Right? Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. What happens if I add 7 to all these scores to the variance? Well, it tells you right there. It doesn't change the variance, does it? So if I'm a, if I'm a distribution of scores, okay? I'm a distribution. Let's put me here. We're going to, no, we're here because I'm going to go that way, and that way is going to be positive. Okay, we're going to add a constant. Didn't change the shape. Didn't change the spread out of this. Right. The expected value of a score times a constant is the mean x bar times the constant. Again, if I had the score of 10 as our average for whatever the hell we're measuring, and I multiplied all the scores times 7, we would expect a new, very, a new mean, I'm sorry, of 70, right? Does that make sense? <coughs> right? Makes sense. Now, the variance of x times k. is s squared sub, k, uh, sub x, so that's the, the original variance, times the constant squared. Remember, it's a squared value, so you have to square the constant. So if our mean is 10, and let's say, well, let's make the math easy, let's say our variance is 10 as well. And we've multiplied all the scores times 7, that was our constant, k, What's our new variance? Do it in your heads. Don't get a calculator. What's 7 squared? Thank you. What's 10 times 49? 490. Because you just put an extra zero. Oh, I'm so bad. You, no, that's not. Would you say like. A, 38 or unknowable or something? It's like, I don't know. No one will ever know. It's impossible. It's like, what's a million times a million? What did you say? A million. Yeah. That's a line from The Simpsons, right? When Nelson says, uh, it's like, what's the square root of a million? No one will ever know. It's, actually, that's a pretty. Don't you have to do 10 times 10? No, I said the variance was 10. I said the standard deviation was 10, that'd be 100. Yeah, times 49. That's 49. That's what I was thinking. Don't be afraid of numbers of arithmetic, please. Now, if you're doing this on a quiz and I gave you something and you want to double check it, that's fine. And even if you want to go, okay, 10 times 49, and then you go, okay, carry the well, that's fine. Do that, do that. See, you should also learn how to just a little bit of arithmetic in your head. When I 
times you know that, and we got all the squares of all numbers up to 25, because it was like, you'll, you should know how to do this, because you're supposed to be a civilized adult. The new world changed. I blame the internet and uh, the media, and the media blame it. Questions about this? Do you see what's happening? To, to, this is all, all it's saying is that when you multiply times something, different things happen than when you add something. K is a constant. It's just a math thing. It just means it's the same in the world. Okay? Yeah, that, that's. So you're just moving the distribution if you add? If you're, if you're just moving it, yeah. If you multiply, you're moving it and you're making it fatter if it's a positive number. Or sorry, if it's a greater than one number, let's forget positive or negative. So if it's greater than one, you make it fatter. So that's the one that you need to think about. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in what cases would this be useful? Um, if you were doing something, think about something like this. If you were converting units, which you often do, if you're converting units from elapsed time to speed, right? That's actually a reciprocal case, right? It's think of it as kilometers and kilometers per hour. Sorry, uh, hours or seconds and then meters per second. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what you're doing here. You're multiplying times yes. constant. Except the constant that makes us less than one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, good question. Other questions about this? Yeah, Brick? Okay, so going back to the beginning. Um, okay, first year, cool. I just like tried to think about it and it's, <coughs> I'm blank. Yes. So, okay, so you know when we were talking about y and <coughs> nine minus one and you said yeah. if we're, it's a statistic we would lose a degree. We're free, you know? that's correct. Okay, and like you said, it would not be, it would no longer be an unbiased estimated that's correct. population parameter. That's correct. I totally get that, Good. but I just don't understand why. I understand what you're saying, like the concept of it, but yeah. I don't understand the reason behind it. Uh, do I need to, or well, like, is that well, much? Well, it's nice if you, if you have at least an intuitive feel for it. And that's okay. that if you are, when you are calculating a variance for a population, you actually are using the whole population. Like that's, it's a real quantity. Yeah. When you're estimating something, you had to fix this value. So the numbers are free to vary to a certain extent, but not completely free. Because they have to Because you fix the mean. So you've lost a degree of freedom. So you're actually divided by how many numbers could vary, not how many numbers you have. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? Okay, so we'll stop this. There's some stuff I want to show you.